Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to my channel. My name is Paul, the Canadian Snowman, here with Geography. Now, Qatar, 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 right? Sorry. I'm going to learn in two seconds, I promise, on how to pronounce this. I'm sorry. Uh, but yes, we're going we're gonna to know a whole lot about you guys because I really don't know much or anything at all. But that's all going to change today. So let's jump into this. Please hit that like and subscribe button below, please, and thank you. And yeah, let's do it. All right. Come on, game. Game. Uh, right here. Three, two, one, bam. Here's a tip. Just eat something with artificial raspberry flavoring. Okay, why is that? You just ate beaver Blueberry. anus extract. Cutter, cutter, uh, cutter, cutter, and that's how you do it. Cutter. It's time to learn geography now. Hey everybody, I'm your host Barb's. Full disclosure, it's actually fully acceptable to say Qatar as well because you know over time most people kind of just messed up the pronunciation and the locals are just kind of like, let's just go with it. In any case, Qatar is a country that I've been very fortunate to visit, and I have to say there's something very unique about this place. It's kind of like yeah, buildings are big. Oh hey cousins, <laughs> how you doing? Well, not gonna say hi? Uh, whatever, I'm just passing through. I'm gonna pick up a Ferrari I just bought. Let me guess, they ate 12 super fast. <laughs> I got 12 of those. <laughs> it's cute how you think that's impressive. No, the classic 250 GTO. How did you get that? I okay, so obviously, uh, Qatar is rich. Uh, I think I've heard this in a previous episode, so you guys definitely got a lot of money, right? Pretty much right? That's kind of what they're saying, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's cute how you think that's impressive. No, the classic 250 GTO. How did you get that? I've been wanting that car. <laughs> you snooze, you lose, cousin. Oh, by the way, Dubai sucks. Hey, <laughs> we'll be back. I got a bigger building than yeah, you. I got more oil. Yeah, everyone is kind of keeping their eyes on Qatar right now. There's a lot going on, and they have a very interesting plan for the future. But first, let's see where it all goes down on the map. Let's do it. The whole Gulf is a fascinating area of the world. We've done quite a few of these countries already, like Bahrain and Kuwait. And now we yep. skip over to the small peninsula with lots of ambition. First of all, the country is located on the Arabian Peninsula as a smaller mini peninsula that juts into the Persian Gulf, sometimes called Arabian Gulf, from Saudi Arabia, the only land border country. The country is only about 117 miles long and 53 miles wide. The Bahrain Gulf separates them from the small island nation of Bahrain. However, as we mentioned a long time ago in the Bahrain episode, these little wispy dry islands right here known as the Hawara Islands, less than one nautical mile from the mainland actually belong to Bahrain. Well, all of them except this little guy, Jinan Island. The country is otherwise divided into eight municipalities with the capital and largest city, Doha, located on the east coast of the country. Here you can also find the biggest, busiest, and only international airport, the elaborate and ritzy Hamad International. Just to skip to the coast, you can also find the main shipping port, Hamad Port. Keep in mind, the larger Doha metropolitan area and its surrounding suburbs in itself holds about 80% of the entire population of the country. Otherwise, the largest town spatially detached from the general Doha area would probably be Al Hor up north with about 32,000 people, and the largest town on the west coast, Duhan, with only about 12,000 people. Roadways traverse every region of the nation, as well as a newly built rail line that services both Doha Metro and long distance passenger and freight nice. trains that cross into Saudi Arabia. Otherwise, there are only two roads that exit the country the Salwa Road on the west and the number 59 Qatar UAE Road that heads into Saudi Arabia and then swings east towards the UAE. If you zoom in, you can even see the border with Saudi Arabia is clearly demarcated with adjacent fences and a road even cutting through sand dunes. No, seriously though, Doha's wow. airport is pretty impressive. It has like a massive teddy bear sculpture thing in it for some reason. I mean, if there's one thing Qatar likes, it's like weird postmodern sculpture and figure art, calligraphy and force of nature sculptures, the giant clams and the uterus with embro lineup what? thing. At one point, they even had a statue depicting Zidane's headbutt, but it was taken down. Now, much of this fast-paced development is also driven by the fact that they are host to the World Cup, making them not only the first Middle Eastern country to do so, but also the smallest. And that brings us to places of interest. Okay, uh, wow, it's the World Cup, so, oh, that's awesome. Because uh, Euro Cup's going on right now. Uh, so next year. Uh, but yeah, uh, definitely, I, I love play, like cool statues and stuff. That, that's awesome. And I'm, I'm so glad that there's like, you know, railway systems and all that kind of cool stuff, because I figure a lot of money probably, you know, can afford to have all you know all these easy transportation ways, right? And uh, uh, that airport looked pretty impressive. So, anyways, let's get on with it. Cool statues. So I guess there was with the headbutting uh, statue, there was controversy, huh? 
only the first Middle Eastern country to do so, but also the smallest. And that brings us to places of interest. If you decide to visit, some places you might want to check out include the Doha Corniche, the National Museum of Art, the Islamic Museum of Art, Aspire Park, Katara Cultural Village, the Banana Island, Al Hazm, so many what? mosques, and the National One. I was going to say. Katara Cultural Village, the Banana Island. Wow, sorry, the Banana Island definitely caught my eye. Man. And that's gotta be like a nice resort for people going on like honeymoons and stuff, or a beverage park for the, the very rich. Look at all this stuff. Probably have like casinos and like the awesome beach. Man, that's impressive. I guess you either come by boat or you got helicopter, or you know, or by helicopter, right? Dang, that's awesome. I want to go to Bay Island. Island, oh, yeah. Al Hazm, so many mosques and the national one, so many forts. This one's probably the most famous one. And there's so many malls. Whoa. And personally, my favorite spot when I visited was Souk Wakif in Doha. You can find everything there from gold to exotic animals, some of which I have a gut feeling may have been illegally obtained. But we can talk about that some other time. Otherwise, moving on. <laughs> Now, Qatar is, yes, an incredibly dry nation like every other country around them. And to the untrained eye on the surface, you look at Qatar and think, Wow, it's just a big empty sand field. Oh, no. Is there anything else going on here? Oh, there's a lot going on. You just have to literally dig deeper. For one, the country is surrounded by small low-lying islands and coral reefs on nearly every coast. The largest non-man-made island offshore being the easternmost point of Qatar's domain, Halul Island, about 50 miles northeast of Doha. It acts as a storage and loading terminal for oil in the surrounding offshore fields. We'll talk about those later. Qatar is generally flat with small grainy hills and dunes until you get to the west parts with the Dukhan Ridge all along the coast by the Bay of Salwa. This is the rockiest area in Qatar with eroded limestone outcroppings. At the southern part of this ridge, you find the tallest point, Qurayn Abu Al-Bal, at only about 103 meters high. Qatar is also one of the 17 countries without rivers or permanent flowing water sources, and all water in the country must be obtained by one of three ways. Desalinization from the sea, groundwater extraction, and recycled wastewater, which makes about 14% of the demand. The country also holds no natural lakes, however man-made ones do exist all over, including this one, the largest inland body of water in the Al Rayan municipality, known as the New Industrial Area Wide Lake. The weird thing is, see this small partially evaporated pond in the middle of nowhere? These are the Al Karana sewage ponds, and every year around November to April, tons of flamingos flock to this one spot and feed off the waters. In the Al Khor region of the northeast, you find the most most densely packed mangrove region of the country. Flamingos come. Do, do, do people ever go and like, visit that, like a kind of like a tourist attraction? You know, go check out the flamingos. Just curious. In the Al Khor region of the northeast, you find the most densely packed mangrove region of the country, including Purple Island, which is famous for purple sea lavender plants that grow on it. Years of flat land contact with the sea has left many salt flats, or sabkas, all over the country, most of which are found in the southeast, between Mesaid to what is probably considered Qatar's best kept secret, Khawar al Audaid, known as the Inland Sea. This place has massive, picturesque sand dunes that creep along a shallow inlet, only accessible by off road vehicles, as no roads lead to it. Whew, yeah, purple lavender and sewer pond wow. flamingos. What a place. Is there any kind of like, I know these, uh, these things change all the time. Any like plans for them to actually get a road there? Because I imagine you could probably have a good, you know, tourist spot there, or not even tourist spot, just for the locals to kind of go and I don't know, I guess everyone's, it's a smaller country, I guess everyone kind of have access to like a beach, you know, because it's a peninsula, so maybe they wouldn't really need to, so I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> And with that, it's time for my triple shot espresso break, which means Noah usually comes in, but he's visiting family, so uh, I don't know which character should we select. Caleb, enter and fight! <laughs> Now, when you look at Qatar on a surface level, it seems pretty confusing. Arid, barren land with luxury skyscrapers. What is going on and, and how did it happen? Well, I'm sure the majority of you viewers have already figured it out. Farming! No! Although, yes, they do have a small agriculture industry, even though less than 2% of the land is arable. Pearling and fishing? That's how Qatar used to make money, like over a hundred years ago, when they used to be one of the poorest countries on Earth. Robot camel racing! That is a unique sport found here specifically in the Al 
Shahania area, but it's what? not the main driving industry. Yeah, 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 I know it's the petroleum and natural gas industry. I just wanted to see how long I could drag out this segment. Well, that was very anticlimactic. Yes, about 70% of government revenue, 60% GDP, and 85% of export earnings are driven from Qatar's petroleum and natural gas industry. They have the world's third largest proven natural gas reserves, about 13% of the world's total. Mostly offshore in the Persian Gulf in the North Field and inland on the west side of the Dukan Field. They are the second largest exporter of natural gas after Russia, and all of it is managed by the state-owned company Qatar Petroleum. Recently, Qatar has been trying to diversify their economic portfolio outside the energy sector into other fields like industry and manufacturing. They have steel and petrochemical plants, as well as tourism and even media. Unfortunately though, Qatar ranks often as the number one spot of most carbon dioxide emissions per capita at 40 metric tons per person. Nonetheless, the country does have wildlife found within various regions. You can find mountain goats, Asiatic jackals, sand cats, Arabian ostriches, and the national animal, the oryx. Cool. Oh. The north side of Qatar is famous for having sea turtles that wash up on shore. With the pollution and all, like, is it like really noticeable like in the big city? Because I know like you go like Hong Kong, you know, you can definitely, you know, you can definitely tell. Uh, so just curious. Or and lay there. The north side of Qatar is famous for having sea turtles that wash up on shore and lay their eggs on the beach. Speaking of eggs, food! That was kind of a twisted way to transition, but okay, great writing, Barbs. Thank you! <laughs> Much of the food is actually imported due to their limited agriculture. Nonetheless, we were told these dishes are often popular in Qatar. Saluna stew, haris, madruba, balalit, marguk, lukiyama, um ali, and what is considered the national dish, Qatari-style makbus. We start I started thinking this place had nothing but sand, and now we end up with a broad biosphere, even with some rare animals. But surprisingly enough, another rare species in Qatar would technically be the Qatari person. Let's explain it. Thank you, Caleb. Now, when going to Qatar, it's kind of like a Steve Irwin special. Uh, let's explain. Caleb, how's your Steve Irwin impression? Great! I'm here in the wilderness of Qatar, looking for one of the rarest species known locally is the actual Qatari citizens. Oh, bloody hell, I think I saw one. Ah, no, <laughs> that was just an Egyptian. Those guys are tricky. Yeah, Qatar has like the lowest population of its own citizens in its own country. Let's explain. Really? The country has about 2.6 million people and has the highest proportion of any country of ex compared to the total population. They also have the highest prevalence of males in a population at around 3.4 males per female. Only about 12% of the entire country is made up of people that are Qatari citizens, the majority of whom are Gulf Arab or General Arab in their ethnic makeup. The remaining 88% are made up of expats hailing from all over the world. From the expat community, numbers are a little wow. hard to pin down on exact percentages, but from what I've gathered from various sources, it seems that about 18% or so are other Arabs from various other nations like Egypt, Jordan, and Syria making the total Arab population somewhere around maybe 30%. From there, the next largest communities come from India at about 25% of the population. The Philippines comes in at third at around 10%. And from there, the rest come from a slew of other nations, mostly from South Asia, the Middle East, and North Africa, with a few small groups of Europeans and Americans. They use the Qatari Rial as their currency. They use the types D and G plug outlets. Remember, they used to be a British territory. And they drive on the right side of the road. Now, as you can see, Qatar has a lot of expats. And like all other Gulf states, becoming an actual citizen of Qatar is actually pretty difficult. It's like, I want to be a Qatari, Qatari citizen. citizen. What do I do? Naturalization requires continuous residence for 25 years and less than two months absence per calendar year. Also, you need to have proven sustainable income and functional knowledge of the Arabic language. Dual citizenship is not allowed. I, I, I don't think I have any of that. But my mom is a Qatari. It only counts if your dad is Qatari. Wait, are you from Bahrain? Yes. Do you have links to the Banu Tamim tribe? I think so, maybe. I'll see what I could do. Yeah, Bahrain is like the only country that they once offered quicker citizenship filing. It was a little controversial, look it up. Anywho, Qatar wow. is a monarchy led by an emir. What is an emir? It's not exactly a king, it's like a big leader important type of guy thing. Some say it's a constitutional monarchy, some say it's absolute, but either way, they have been led by the House of Tani since 1868. The main language of course is Arabic, spoken with a general Gulf dialect. The predominant and state religion of Qatar is Islam, mostly belonging to the Salafi movement of Wahhabi. 
Wahhabism, and about 5 to 15 percent are Shia. Christians make up about 15 percent of the population, mostly from the Filipino and American communities, and Hinduism comes in third at around 13 percent, mostly from the Indian community. And that brings us to Variety. culture stuff. As usual, here's your daily dose of Random Hannah. Traditionally, Qatar has a history that goes back millennia to Bedouin tribes. The harsh conditions inland forced the ancient inhabitants to turn to the sea for survival and cultural influence. Qatar is known for having some of the most elaborate Dao boats, which you can see today in harbors. And there's even a Dao festival at the Qatara Cultural Village. Occasionally, you might see people playing the traditional board game Dama. It's kind of like an Arab chess. Falconry is popular yeah. amongst most Gulf countries, especially with the elite. They even have one of the few falcon hospitals in the world that literally only what? focuses on falcon health. During Ramadan, it's not uncommon to see children celebrating Garan Garu, similar to Halloween. Okay, I'm curious. Since a lot of people have falcons, you know how there's like dog parks, you know, for dogs? Do people get their falcons together and, you know, I don't know, get them to play with each other or, I don't know, have races with your falcons or something, I don't know. It just seems like something very interesting. Anyways. Ramadan, yeah. it's not uncommon to see children celebrating Garan Garu, similar to Halloween in which the kids go around gathering candy. Like other Gulf states, the traditional cool. garment for men are thobes, with the gatra and agal headdresses. Typically, it's said that Qatari men prefer to wear their gatras in a cobra style, but it can be worn other ways too. And if you can find the incredibly rare Qatari citizen woman, they can often be seen in the typical black abayas and hijab. Abayas can sometimes be more form-fitting, with colorful patterns on the hijabs and sleeves. If a woman really wants to be scandalous, they can wear a shorter abaya over pants and show off their luxury knee-high stilettos. On special occasions like weddings, colorful dresses are worn as well. Qataris prefer to keep things classic and hold the events in massive tents in the desert with loud music, celebrating, and knife dancing. And speaking of music, now it's time for Keith's music segment. But guess what? Keith is actually not here. He's in Germany or somewhere. No one cares. I guess we'll have to have someone <laughs> fill in. Who do we have on our roster, Paul? Um, let's see, uh, Caleb already went, so, um, I guess, uh, Art, um, now's your moment to shine. I don't think I can fill Keith's shoes. He's just really good at this part. Okay, you know it. what? Um, now Keith is with us in spirit. Get a Keith shirt at geographynow.com. Or don't. <laughs> That was like Keith. Keith does that. Let's say you live in Qatar before the petroleum industry is discovered. You do some fishing and maybe you race a camel. And then what? You play music. There are typically two types of traditional <laughs> themes when it comes to music performed guitar. Songs connected to the sea and songs connected to the desert life. Clapping. No, don't do that. Okay, don't do that. <laughs> Clapping and drums play an important part, especially with these two types of drums being used. And tar tambourines. Typically, all of this can be accompanied with an oud, a lute instrument found all throughout the Arab world. So I guess you could say it's like a Qatar guitar. <laughs> During weddings and other ceremonies, there are two popular dances done. One for men, the Arda, done in two rows facing each other with swords and sticks as poetry is recited. And for women, there's the Kanmari. Usually the women are masked and in colorful dresses while performing. The contemporary music scene of Qatar is just starting to experiment with modern themes outside of traditional elements. The Ministry of Information opened the Qatar Music Academy in 1980, and they just opened their first record label in 2015, DNA Records. And just as a tribute to Keith, in 2010, this dude was the first person to release a metal album out of Qatar. Thank you, Art. I tried. Okay, so. Now, before we move Good on job. to the history section, we do have to kind of address some of the heavy topics that have made headlines. Look, I loved visiting this country, and I'm not trying to take a sinister twist in this episode, but we have to address the stuff nobody wants to talk about. The massive construction boom in the Gulf countries has definitely left an impression on the world, but many have also complained that the practices involved in getting here are a little controversial. I'm not going to go too far into it, but essentially I'm talking about the kafala system. Hundreds of thousands of expats and their families, especially from less developed nations, mostly in the construction and domestic servant industries, have given angry testimonials towards the business practices of their employers. This system basically monitors and ties the migrants in with their sponsors and employers. Upon arriving, often a series of fees the workers are expected to pay off are given, which kind of immediately puts them in a type of debt. It is not uncommon for employers to take the passports of their workers to keep them from leaving. On top of that, living conditions are not always optimal for labor workers and incidents of abuse and sexual assault have been reported but are rarely ever brought to the law. This is why, yes, Qatar does have the highest per capita income in the world at nearly 150k average. 
average, but that wealth is almost entirely exclusive to the Qatari citizen minority and a few privileged legal residents. A large portion of expats, especially in the construction industry, do not make that much. No way to really smoothly transition out of this one, so here's the history section. In the quickest way I can put it, Bedouin people. Come on, Qatar, we gotta, we gotta do better, a little better here, you know? You know, yeah, come on, guys. We don't want, you know, guys are working hard, we don't want them in debt, you know, basically paying off their debts and taking, uh, I don't know, I know what else to say. But oh, I just hope things improve, that's all. Really smoothly transition out of this one, so here's the history section. In the quickest way I can put it, Bedouin people and Bedouin tribes, Persian control, Islam comes in, Ottomans, the Al Wajba War, British protectorate, war with Bahrain, oil is found, nearly became one of the Emirates, independence, problems with Saudi Arabia, everything is good, then Gulf problems, lots of crazy new buildings come up, and here we are today. Some of the famous people from this country that you guys suggest. Oh, second. That's a cool looking building. I wish more countries would do this though, you know? Instead of having the typical, you know, box rectangle buildings, man, put, I understand that, you know, it's a lot cheaper to do it that way, but this is a lot more pleasing to the eye. I mean, that'd be cool. Especially like an office up here, how your office would be like, you know, rounded. That'd be cool, but definitely would y'all well done when it comes to like the architecture of your buildings. Anyways. Lots of crazy new buildings come up, and here we are today. Some of the famous people from this country that you guys suggested we mention include pretty much all the emirs and all the ministers. Mansur Muftah, Mutaz Barshim, Sofia Al Maria, Akbar Al Bakr, Nasser Al Khalifi, Nur Al Malki, Bahia Mansur Al Hamad, Fahad Al Kubaisi. Venus Raj was technically born in Doha, so some people think it counts. And pretty much any soccer or football player. One, well, if you really want to learn about Qatar, the, this is a really cool YouTuber guy. His name is Mr. Q. So yeah, that's. That's just about it. Uh, let's move on to the friend zone. Now, when it comes to Qatar's friends, I'm pretty sure you may have seen a few headlines in the news recently. Things have gotten a little dramatic, but they still have their diplomatic ties all around the world. For one, the US and Brits have had close ties for a while. They were a British protectorate after the Ottomans left in World War I, which is also how English became a very well-taught language. The Brits also make up one of the largest numbers of European expats in Qatar. As for the US, they have close educational and military ties. Some US universities have overseas campuses in Doha, like Texas A&M, and they agreed to station the US Central Command's forward headquarters and the Combined Air Operations Center in Qatar. Japan is probably their closest East Asian friend and business partner, as the majority of Japan's petroleum and oil are directly sourced from Qatar. Prime Minister Abe and the Emir have both made official visits, and the relationship is very cordial. Now back to home base, things are a little tricky with the other Gulf states. In 2017, there was the Qatar diplomatic crisis in which Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Egypt, and a bunch of other countries led a joint severing of ties due to the accusations of Qatar forming ties with terrorist organizations and suspicious relations with Iran. Of course, Qatar denies all the harsh claims and has their side of the story, but the point is everything, even airspace travel from Qatar-based airlines, was restricted. Saudi Arabia even said they might plan digging a long moat along the border, which would effectively make Qatar an island. Qatar did not reciprocate the blockade and is actually still open to the flowing of people, goods, and business, but it's complicated for now. Out of the Gulf, Kuwait and Oman did not sever ties and are probably the closest family members in the area. Area. They often act as mediators that help with maintaining order in the Gulf states, and Qatar, of course, being their newest project. Otherwise, I was told another best friend they get along with really well is Turkey. Not only do they have numerous bilateral treaties signed since the 70s, but they always seem to agree and back each other up on most regional issues, like the Syrian civil war and the Egyptian crisis. In 2015, the Emir and Erdogan announced plans for a Turkish military base in Qatar, which would make it the first time Turkey had such a presence in the Gulf. In the end, they get along really well. In conclusion, Guthrie started out with poor pearl divers and now has become the Wow, I was definitely wrong with who your best friends would be because the one I guessed uh, kind of wants to have a, a moat around, you know, cutting you guys off. So, yeah, my bad. Uh, but anyways, we're going to close our shop here. Here we go really well. In conclusion, Qatar started out with poor pearl divers and now has become the wealthy black sheep of the Gulf. Things are moving fast and people are paying attention to them. The spotlight is yours, Qatar. Make your move. Stay tuned. Romania is coming up next. Uh, Romania. Wow, Qatar, you guys are definitely a very rich country. Uh, I guess, you know, just because you guys are a small country, you know, I guess you don't have to worry about, you know, the money kind of sharing it amongst like, you know, 
a lot of time you got the you know part of your country is you know when it has all the people and stuff and then you have a big giant part that's very you know very sparse inhabited you know you know what i mean so you don't have to worry about kind of like spreading the money far out there uh so i think that definitely helps and definitely got a lot the banana island that is very impressive very cool stuff uh tourism definitely picking up and i guess you know the controversial stuff is you know that's a small reason you might have to have a lot of money besides the oil is just because you know uh you know how the how the whole working thing kind of works you know so but anyways you guys look like very impressive country uh very rich country like i said and i'm mean, definitely expecting big things from you guys in the future because it just seems like the sky's the limit since you guys are very rich uh, what you guys can do so i'm kind of kind of curious to see what you will do in the, in the coming future so anyways guys please hit that like and subscribe button below please and thank you and i'll catch you guys in future videos doing every country in the world if you're looking for like you know war videos and stuff like that definitely check out the playlist got some cool stuff going on there but anyways guys peace catch you guys in future videos i am out of here you guys have a great night or great day and all that fun stuff see you guys later